uh, super happy to be here. Uh, loved all of the presentations so far. Um, it was really cool to get to see Emily go over her new SDLC talk. Um, and today I am going to talk to everybody about a framework that I put together a little while ago called Charming Pirates. And so um, this is about really starting to think about how do we think about user uh, acquisition and referral for open source software um, and a quick introduction of myself. So, hi, I'm Tasha Drew. Um, I live in San Francisco, California. I'm director of product incubation in an organization called X Labs, which is in the office of the CTO here at VMware. Um, in X Labs, I focus on identifying and funding products that are one to three years ahead of market um, to then form a team around building those products and projects in collaboration with partners, customers, and our business units. When I um, and so, yeah, it's really fun. We do a lot of different stuff, uh, and as a result, I'm usually thinking about business models, new technology, how we're going to exit this. But also, we we really partner with our business units to exit the technology to market, using them as our go-to market vehicle. Um, it, in addition to that, in my copious free time, I work in upstream Kubernetes. I am the co-chair for SIG usability and the Kubernetes working group for multi-tenancy. Uh, so if you're at KubeCon, we got a couple of really good talks coming from both of those groups. Um, we would love to see you there. Um, and then, and this is very applicable to this talk. I am a former core team member of the Habitat.sh project, uh, which was an, which is an open source project out of Chef Software. Um, and that's when I really started to think about how do we think about open source software, um, and how do we think about user adoption and user acquisition of open source software, and are we doing the right things um, to make that software successful, given all of the time and money and investment and like hours awake working on it uh, and just sort of the way it takes over our minds. Um, you know, are we doing what it needs to be successful in life? Uh, I do a lot of other stuff too. I'm on Twitter. Uh, and so uh, taking a couple steps back, uh, why do we even open source? Um, I'm not sure. So I know a lot of people are probably on this call and they're like, I know why I open source, but sometimes I don't think people really understand open source at all. Um, and I'm going to just kind of caveat that with a, um, if you think about like, hey, I wrote this thing, I'm going to put it up on the internet, I'm going to put it on GitHub, I'm going to put it on GitLab, I want people to see it, I want people to use it. Why are you doing that? Right? Like, and as a business, why are you doing that? Uh, I think last week, Adam Jacob, uh, the co-founder of Chef, asked a question on Twitter uh, that really uh, made me laugh because it was very lighthearted, but he's like, what is your most hated phrase in technology? And everyone was submitting what their most hated phrase in technology was. And his is open source business model. Uh, and, and that's fair, Adam, that's, that's fair. Um, but some reasons that people open source, you can do it for a lot of different reasons. You can do it for incredibly smart strategic reasons. Um, so just kind of looking at like, this is just like Tasha's brain dump of like different reasons. I've heard people say they're going to open source something. Sometimes you open source to gain mind share around how you solved a certain problem. Uh, sometimes you open source stuff to just show that you're really smart and that your team is solving really hard problems. And it's almost just as a way to sort of advertise like, hey, this is something cool we do. Um, um, come work for us, right? Like, and there's almost like no interest in people actually using the technology. It's just, look at this, isn't it cool? Um, sometimes people open source uh, to challenge an incumbent. And I still think that the Kubernetes open source strategy release out of Google uh, was one of the most fascinating opportunities to disrupt the model of public cloud that I've ever seen. I feel like you could definitely write a book about it just from a business and, and uh, techno technology landscape per perspective. But but what was even more interesting is once that model of abstracting how we deliver cloud APIs was delivered, how it not only took out two incumbents who had years ahead of Kubernetes, um, just because they weren't fast enough to make what they were doing as open and flexible um, and focus on building the community versus trying to protect an open source business model, um, but also who jumped on it really fast Microsoft, 
Kubernetes didn't come out of Microsoft, but Microsoft saw it as a way to just break public cloud open and really start challenging AWS. And now when you start thinking about public clouds, when Kubernetes came out, you really didn't think about other anyone other than AWS. And now that Kubernetes is out, even though everyone has different capabilities and strengths as public cloud platforms, Kubernetes really just broke that business model wide open. So, you know, kind of being super smart about saying, hey, let's open source something really powerful. And then how could that really crack open this market, but then being really intentional about how you then enter that market and start to make money. And the way that you might monetize the open source opportunity might have nothing to do with the open source, like monetizing the actual open source components themselves. So anyway, I'm just saying like, there's a lot going on here and I don't know how cerebral a lot of people are about it, but there is an opportunity to kind of dig in and start really thinking about it. Um, I just want to call out, I put GitHub stars on here and it's not facetious. Um, it is amazing to me how seriously people take GitHub stars. I mean, we all do because there's such a proliferation of open source projects on GitHub that figuring out what people have even looked at becomes like a tiny signal is like, hey, this thing might be more interesting than these other 75 things that are also seem to be in this space, but have like zero or two GitHub stars. But in addition to that, there are marketing professionals who've had incredible careers who will tell you how they have gamified GitHub stars to get higher valuations for their companies. Um, and it's just a game, right? Like, and so you'll just put up a landing page for your cute open source project and just poke the star button to show that you support us, the up and comers, and ignore that billion dollar valuation nine months later. I mean, this stuff really works. So, you know, lots of reasons to open source, a uh, fascinating business space, but don't try, you know, be, be wary of your business models. So to talk about the framework I developed, I'm going to explain to you the challenge that I was trying to solve when I originally came up with this and why I was even thinking about this in the first place. So starting at Chef, we had built a project called Habitat. Um, it was really cool way to automate the way that you delivered software um, in the, both the build and the runtime phase. We we're in Rust, we we're doing distributed system stuff. We had rolling updates and like you could basically tell your software how it should work in different scenarios when you built it. So then your ops person wouldn't have to run around and kind of figure it out and operationalize it on the fly later, having less subject matter expertise in the system. It was complex, it was powerful, it was awesome. It solved problems that still haven't been solved and that I see show up every day in my daily work. Um, but it was fundamentally disruptive to configuration management because it was focused on a completely different segment of technology. So as a result, um, we, we had some problems where marketing didn't really have an incentive to talk about us at all because they needed to focus on monetizing the business, which was focused around other technologies. Sales really didn't wanna talk about us unless they had to save a deal by kind of showing the new cool thing. Um, so we weren't gonna get any adoption through the major channels that you would normally look to as part of a startup. Um, so as a team, we were very well funded on an engineering perspective, user design and all of these places, but no great uh, megaphone um, was provided to us. So really strong. And we also had a really strong open source ethos. Um, and this is something I'll dig into a little bit when I get into the funnel, but identifying the parts of your open source project that are going to be easy for new users to come in, connect with, contribute to. Adam and the founders, uh, Jamie and Fletcher of the Habitat Project are very smart. You know, you have chef cookbooks and kind of say what you will um, about Ruby, but it is easy for people to get in there, contribute, put something out there and start being part of sort of the machinery of making a very popular open source project. And Habitat had the same thing. We had plans. You could come in and write a plan to describe how your software would behave. Easy on ramp, easy flexibility. And that is something that some open source projects that are also very powerful Black. Um, so we had a lot of good building blocks, but we needed help on just how do we actually grow this thing. Um, so I started thinking about user acquisition frameworks. Um, so there is this, uh, there's this um, basic uh, metric system um, that I'll go over uh, and it, it's called Startup Metrics for Pirates. There's a bunch of blog posts, surprisingly not as many as I would have thought because it was 2007, you know, YouTube was young, but 
Uh, as far as I'm aware, Startup Metrics or Pirates kicked off with a conference talk by Dave McClure 2007. And if you're in product management, product marketing, engineering leadership in startups for long enough, you will hear this phrase because it's foundational to how people think about attracting SaaS revenue and building SaaS revenue engines. Um, so what is it? Pirate Metrics, um, just as a glance, we start at acquisition. I am aware of your product. You are aware potentially of me. I might sign up on a landing page. I might give you my email address. You can market to me. So I have, I'm acquired. Um, then we have activation, which is the next step in the funnel. I actually use your product. Um, I, even though I may have signed up for an account previously, I log in, I click around. And that's a big deal. You know, there's a lot of lonely logins that people have never done this step with. So how do I get you from I signed up to actually log in, click around. Retention. I come back, I use it again. Um, I keep interacting, at least in some way. Um, and then uh, referral. I'm telling other people about the product. Now, you might think it's weird that referral comes before revenue, but this is how you start to grow a virality of your product. If people are talking about it, that at, at certain stages in growth is more important than um, people paying you initially because you just want to really start to grow the number of users you have. And then finally, revenue. I have signed up for some sort of renewing subscription license to your product. And then the name, why do we call this Pirate Metrics? It's because it sells are. So there you go. Happy pirate day. I think I'm early. So once you know about pirate metrics, they are everywhere. Um, when you think about net promoter score, um, that sort of uh, questionnaire people are always sending you like one to 10, or would you recommend us to a friend? All of this stuff kind of came out of pirate metrics, but then built this really interesting industry around how do we start to automate our understanding of customer success um, of, you know, all these software plugins for things like Salesforce and other tools. Um, and all of this thing where it's like, activate, come back, refer a friend. Um, there was a really uh, phenomenal uh, net promoter score was introduced in 2003. So just a couple of years before we started thinking about these pirate funnels. Um, so all of this kind of stuff all came out at the same time, but super focused on the big move at that time, which was subscription revenue instead of term license terms. Um, but yeah, so kind of taking all of that, all of these frameworks are used to uh, power marketing platforms now. And so marketing platforms start to track how everybody is using every part of a product. So landing page, sign up for a white paper, log into your SaaS product. How can we map users uniquely through all of this so that we understand whether our products are successful or not, also whether we have any drop-offs. So like if someone comes in, like if we get the entire world to sign up for a thing, but nobody ever logs in, there's probably some sort of problem in that on-ramp that you can then dive into and start to understand. So starting to automate your understanding of your own on-ramps into your product and defining what is success is super important. Now back to open source, people try to treat major components of their open source strategy if they're really trying to like make this a foundational technology like SaaS funnel conversion, but the two are completely different. Um, so if you are trying to locate everyone who ever signs up for your open source project by having some sort of like sign up for an email here and then putting your entire, you know, outbound marketing sales team on their case and starting to phone them and connect to them, they're probably going to be really upset because that's not why they came to you. They came to you to use your open source project. Open source is a lot about trust. I'm going to trust you to provide me free software um, and I'm going to download it and I'm going to use it. And there's a community and like, there has to be this trust boundary. But when you are breaking the trust boundary, you can ruin your own investment in this compelling technology. So you have to treat these two, two user adoption funnels very differently. Um, and so that's kind of where I was having some challenges as we were trying to use Habitat, um, but plug it into this go-to-market strategy that was very focused on revenue. And there was a gap there. And so I needed to kind of take a step back and prove the value of my team's work using numbers and metrics and things that people could really connect to, but uh, also not like not tying it too tightly to this revenue model that I was pretty sure was really going to ruin our credibility with the audience that we were trying to attract. Um, so, uh, 
Yeah. So I, and the other thing you have to start thinking about is like from a marketing team's perspective, from a uh, CEO's perspective, you're looking at an open source project and you're like, why am I sending six people to KubeCon right now? Like, shouldn't we be, you know, shouldn't they be working? Shouldn't they, like, should they be doing engineering stuff? Like, how do you even start to prove like, hey, I sent six people to KubeCon and they talked to like 10,000 people, you know, including you. YouTube views. And then we started to build this trajectory. So how can I kind of start to see like, oh, look at this traction we got related to spending money on the thing, right? So it's like kind of all about how do you plug into proving the value of your work, but also how do you prove this is something we should really invest in. I'm going to give you data to prove that we should continue to invest in it. So kind of trying to like see that this is the framework that the marketers and the salespeople and the CEO can really grok. And I'm going to plug into it with kind of my own spin to be like, yeah, no, what we do actually is very impactful. Um, so I built a maintainer funnel. Um, so kind of thinking about a maintainer funnel, um, and I, I know I'm going to get a lot of like sort of, but Tasha, have you thought about, and I have thought about a lot of stuff, maybe not everything, but just, just give me a little credibility here. Um, so when we think about maintainer funnel, we're thinking about how do I grow people through um, being contributors to my project? Because people um, are going to be huge advocates for something that they actually helped build um, versus they just kind of use and complain about every now and then on the internet. Um, so this is really focused on building a maintainable pipeline from I heard about your open source thing to I'm a maintainer of your open source thing. Um, and like kind of thinking, what are the steps there? What behavior do we have to encourage to get people to go through this? Um, I am going to caveat that a lot of people are not going to be maintainers, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking about this funnel because this funnel also gets them to be users. I um, mean, it gets them to start just maybe being like making an open source pull request to like fix a docs bug. And so if you're not thinking about like, how do I move people from like, I saw your thing on GitHub, I saw it had four stars <laughs> to, hey, it has a hundred thousand stars and uh, I'm a maintainer and I'm really passionate about this project. How do we do that, right? Um, so here's how I started thinking about it. And you can also start putting a lot of this into how you track usage of your own uh, landing pages. So conscious, I know your project exists. Ooh, that's good, right? We can do something there maybe. Helped by, okay. Uh, your project has has solved a pain point for me. And this is key in any adoption of any technology. I have to actually be solving a problem for you, for you to really care. And, you know, in some cases that problem may be boredom, but in a lot of cases it's like, I am consistently pained by this thing, please help me. Uh, then active community member. Okay, like I was helped by your project and now I'm active in the community, hanging out in chat, you know, IRC, whatever. And maybe I submit my first small pull request because you've made it easy for me to do that. I get it. I know how to do it. Then we have reinvesting. Okay, I was active that one time. It felt really good. I'm going to do it again. Maybe I'm going to do a little bigger one, bigger pull request. Um, maybe I'm going to work with the more senior maintainers to understand a harder problem. But this actually takes like real investment from my perspective. Um, and then maintaining. Maintaining means my peers in this project have promoted me to a position of trust. I can now accept pull requests, guide other people. I, may, I understand the roadmap. Um, so this is sort of how I wanted to kind of start thinking about a maintainer funnel for open source. Now, when you start thinking about this overall uh, funnel, uh, I have this great conversation with a really good friend of me who is at Mongo for forever. And he's like, Tasha, I hear you, but time out. Like in the entire history of Mongo, do you wanna know how many like really hard Mongo database problems were solved by like non Mongo employees? And like totally fair, right? Totally fair. Uh, but, uh, and the answer is more than zero just so no one gets their feelings hurt, but it's not a large number. But if you organize your open source project in a smart way, thinking about the fact that you're not going to get people to maintain your distributed systems for free, right? Like that's just hard, get some degrees, really need a lot of information. Um, but you can organize your open source project in such a way that you have parts that are easy for people to help you with. Um, and I have a trick that I shouldn't admit on a recorded TV show, um, but... <laughs> 
sometimes uh, when I'm giving a presentation, I make one tiny thing obviously wrong because people always want to help you. And so then they'll fix the obviously wrong thing and not, you know, freak out about everything else in your, in your presentation. It's kind of like that in open source projects too. Like make it easy for people to fix your typos in the docs, make it easy for people to help your getting started guide. If it gets out of date, um, think about things like cookbooks, YAML files, um, configuration scripts, things that people can come in and read and say, oh, you know, I can make this slightly better or work in this other scenario. And it's easy for me to now reinvest, kind of put my energy into your projects. And now I feel like an owner. Um, and so as I was saying, like in, in Chef World, that's a cookbook. Like it's really easy for people to make a cookbook and share it with each other. And arguably, if you made it even easier and nicer, then you'd get a real return on that investment in just like community goodwill and people loving the technology technology. In Habitat, it was a plan. We had a whole space where you could come in and be a plan maintainer and say, I'm going to be the plan maintainer for OpenSSL. It only needs three lines, but they're going to be the best three lines you've ever seen. So, you know, kind of thinking about just where are those on-ramps into my technology to start to get people, A, to understand it, but B, to really feel like they have a part in it. Um, so now kind of taking a step back, looking at this framework, when I think about the conscious helped by phases, um, what's really important in those phases? I need good docs. I need a readme that tells me what am I even looking at right now and why should I care? I need to understand what your licensing is. Um, and I need to have a good first touch experience. Um, all of this needs to be self-driven um, because the scale of users that you're going to have coming in at this is going to be large. And even no matter how big your team is on the back end, you don't want people to have to really sync themselves in these couple steps. Your project is never gonna scale. Um, now for conscious helped by an active, everything in here could be mostly or entirely automated. Um, so even when I become active, when I make that first pull request to fix the docs or fix this small bug, um, I could make a pull request, but there should be an automated CI pipeline. I should have docs that, uh, how to make your first pull request, right? How to engage with us, how to understand how to make this work. Um, but then when we get into the active stage, now I'm actually contributing, there should be a, you should be measuring sort of your customer side satisfaction, I'm not, I'm not joking, of how people interact with your team. Um, because people need reasonable, professional, friendly, actionable feedback or, um, in a timely manner when they initially engage with you, or they're going to feel burned. Even if you know, you're overwhelmed, you have too much stuff going on, just think about what is the user experience for people coming into my community. Um, so now we move from active to reinvest and maintainer. Um, reinvest and maintainer has to have a human in the loop. Things go really wrong when communities try to, to totally automate this stuff. And a lot of times you'll see this in really critical technologies that just have one or two core maintainers who are just overloaded, tired, this is not their day job. They try to automate all the way through maintainer and you can get some really bad actors in the loop when that happens. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that just kind of thinking about what can I automate and what can't I automate and how do I make sure that I'm following Following the, a smart path um, in both of these is important for moving through this funnel. Um, finally, uh, you need to really think when you get into reinvest in maintainers, people are coming in ready to really spend time on your project. You need a clear roadmap. You need architectural vision docs. You need things where people can come in and say, I want to solve this really hard problem. And, you know, I could make a joke about like cluster API, like um, SIG API machinery in Kubernetes or something, but like Habitat had it too, right? Like I'm going to go change the core gossip protocol algorithm. And you're like, no, no, please don't. Please look, I'd love to talk to you about it, but it's not going to work. Like we've spent, you know, two years thinking about this and would love to hear your idea, but you're going to have to get work really closely with the core team to touch that level of code. Um, so you do just need a way to help people understand I'm like we're thinking about this, we get your problems. Maybe this is not where you want to start. Um, but then we have coaching and mentoring, and we can establish trust over time to build you up to critical functions. Um, and then when people have more context, sometimes they realize they don't want to touch that piece of the code either. And we're just going to go over here. Um, so this is really just an approach to thinking about how to move people through your open source project, make the most out of your investment in your open source project. 
Um, and then also like, what can I automate? What can't I automate? Because at the end of the day, I see this uh, tendency in a lot of corporations uh, and companies to um, say, look, yeah, I'll give you five really senior backend engineers, distributed systems, you got it, we're gonna go build this thing. But you wanted a community engineer, a community manager, and like, that's just not, I don't see the ROI on that. And it's funny, cause like, they're not thinking about the first three, four steps of this, which do you really want your distributed systems team to have to be the guide, the coach, the mentor, and be building all of your really hard technical problems at the same time? Because A, sometimes they didn't really sign up for that. That's not the job that they're interested in. Um, but B, it means they're sinking hours and hours of their time in something that you see as a different set of value. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, just think about the community or you're wasting your time and investment. And in closing, we need to treat the funnel to contributor on par with the funnel to customers so that we're really all maximizing our investment and getting the return on investment that we want to see, but also sharing our mind share um, and our technology with the world in a way that people can really connect with it and use it and use it to solve their problems. So uh, for those who'd like to chat more, I will be in the putting the dev back into DevOps panel. Um, I'd love to see you there and answer any questions you have. And yeah, a great conference. I can't wait to see the next talk.